So good afternoon. Uh, so look, I'm a banker with no charts, okay? So it's just you and me here today. Um, I'm delighted to uh, get that, but I do have a tie. So yeah, at least we got, I've got part of the costume. So uh, I'm delighted to be here with you today. I'm, uh, the topic I'm here to talk to you a little bit about is digital, digital at, uh, at the bank. And what I thought I'd do is really talk about it in uh, three flavors. The first is, what do we see as Royal Bank of Canada looking at the digital space in which we live and we work and the customers that we serve. Second is I'll talk a little bit about the payments landscape. And third, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the investments that we're making to enable the clients that we support, their lifestyles, move in the direction that they want to move in. First of all, I'd say that uh, you know, digitization is, is a broad topic. It's something that we could talk about forever. So why don't I just talk about it in two flavors. First, there's the digitization of the everyday life that we have as consumers. Our consumers, our clients, want to execute their life on whatever platform they want to, whenever they want to see it, and they want whole access to their information uh, in order to be able to make decisions. The second part of digitization is really as we re-engineer the back offices of financial institutions and other companies, regardless of what industry you're in. And so digitization affects everybody, and, and, it, and if you don't focus on both sides of that, uh, that's to your peril. At RBC, we call it building the digitally enabled relationship bank. And the reason we talk about it that way is because we fundamentally believe the digital technology is not going to replace the human interaction that people have, but actually augment it. So the desire for people to continue to meet with one another, whether that's in a branch, whether that's in an office, whether that's in a coffee shop, will still happen. But the ability to access information, to be able to access a different way, to be able to provide different insight, is clearly going to happen at the front end with technology. Now, it's, I think it's important to talk about, uh, and Jennifer talked a little bit about this, about you know, what is happening on the digital landscape on a global basis. When you look at it, Canada is actually behind. The penetration of digital technology in Asia, particularly Australia and New Zealand, is well over 30% in terms of mobile adoption. In Canada, it's around 26%, so we, we lag. At the same time, we've been growing at 50% growth rate of adoption in the last few years since 2015. So we're catching up. But there's still a lot of room for improvement across you know, our great country in terms of, of, of people uh, leveraging and using this kind of capability. At RBC today, we have over 6.5 million digital users. Just under 3.5 million of them are mobile users. And they're really active. We find that the mobile users are far more active than, uh, than online users. In fact, online banking is continuing to stay relatively flat with a, with a very modest growth rate, yet mobile banking is growing at a, on a transaction level at 33% year to year. And from a volume basis and number of users, it's growing at close to 20%. So you have a significant, it's not a shift, it's actually, it's an and in terms of uh, how people are using, choosing to live their life. They're actually trying to live their life through both of those channels. And while we talk about the fundamental aspects of doing bill pay, moving money between, uh, between individuals, which are two of the uh, highest usages of the mobile app, clearly it has to go beyond that. And what we've been doing within our own mobile app is we've been starting to leverage things like artificial intelligence. We're using machine learning to look at how people spend their money and to be able to give them advice on an ongoing basis. We have this function we call Nomi, N-O-M-I, or K-N-O-W, uh, Nomi. In the last five months since we introduced this, we've, uh, we've given more than 120 million insights to clients around the country, to those 3.5 million clients. And we, as a result, uh, we've had great success in terms of getting clients into the right product for them. In fact, we've made over 30,000 changes as a result so that we can get clients into the right products for them. So digital at the mobile interface is more than just an information product. It's more than just an exchange of capability. But it is actually a, a great way for people to glean insight that they used to have to get by walking into a branch or they used to have to get by talking to someone. So clearly, the value proposition is shifting and changing. When we look at technology, though, the branch is still 
there. And we think that the branch still has a great uh, need to be there, although it's changing. And you'll see that change in form factors. You'll see that change in terms of what people see in a branch. But clearly, you have to work at, move at the speed that the customer wants to move, not necessarily at the speed that technology will allow you to move. And that is at the, at the, um, at the core of how we look to serve clients. Now, when we talk about the payment space, you know, I just recently came back from Europe, and I had a chance to meet with some other financial institutions in Europe. We, uh, in Europe, uh, specifically in Scandinavia, they don't accept checks. Checks aren't accepted. On a busy day at the Royal Bank, we'll uh, process $10 billion worth of checks on behalf of clients, 10 billion. So you talk about a big shift. In some of those Scandinavian countries, they talk about not accepting cash by 2021. We believe that, uh, we believe that cash transactions will decline over time, but you know, it'll be 2030 before only 10% of the transactions are happening in cash. So the movement in our geography and the movement in which the Canadians want to move has actually clearly got to be part of our, of our thought process. At RBC, we process 40, $43 trillion worth of payments annually. We process payments in a number of factors. They're large value transactions, transactions for M&A activity, and, and transactions that move across large businesses. Our, our uh, real-time transactions that we process today, you know, peer-to-peer -to -peer payments, are the fastest growing part of the payment space for us. Uh, we do more peer-to-peer -peer payments on a daily basis than Venmo does in the entire United States. Our growth rate in peer-to-peer -peer payments is at a 50% growth rate. And these systems are becoming critical systems, systems that have to be up and available and, and systems that people rely on. So this, this need for safety and soundness or security of this environment is paramount but it's also its ability to scale. Because if people can't move money, if they can't get access to their money, they lose confidence. And that is one thing uh, that we uh, can't allow to happen. So there's a lot of excitement in the pay uh, payments landscape. It's absolutely changing. Uh, you know, you look at uh, new entrants into the marketplace, WeChat, uh, Apple. These, these uh, capabilities are providing services to clients that they're absolutely in need of and desire. Now, you have to believe that the platform, the social platform that people wish to engage and how they wish to engage with their financial institution or with others has got to be something that we can support. And we welcome that competition uh, inside the bank. So when we look at technology as, as a whole and we start to think about the investments that we're making, I'd offer you a few things. First of all, as the leader of technology at the bank, I actually really have to spend most of my time not just dealing about thinking about the technology, but thinking about how the technology fits within the everyday lives of our clients. Clearly, there's a lot of opportunity to, to change and to grow and evolve the business models. And I do agree that it will be an evolution of our core systems and capability as opposed to a revolution within that core capability. But at the front end, it is clearly a revolution. And it's something that we embrace, we adopt, and we accept the challenge on. So where are we investing? First, we are investing heavily in insights. Insights are not just analytics driven by machine learning and artificial intelligence, but insights that actually provide value to the clients every day. We built significant amounts of capacity in order to be able to support that, hiring the best people that we can find and doing research and then applying that capability to the models in which we run. In fact, what we're doing these days is we're taking traditional models, whether they're for risk calculation or for um, loan arrangements, and we're applying artificial intelligence to those to make them operate faster and more accurately. And we're seeing great uplift in that, and we believe that artificial intelligence will provide a lot of uh, capability in terms of efficiency within running a financial institution, but also in what we can put in the hands of our clients. We're changing the manufacturing platform of everything that we do. We call it the manufacturing you know, platform of an application. So if you think of, a, of an application that starts in Agile, where business and technology get together, 
It ends up in a cloud, and in the middle, there's a lot of technology, things you would know as, as continuous integration, DevOps, other technical processes or components. We're continually changing the underpinnings of that manufacturing process. Today, we're, our productivity is about 60% faster. 40% of what we think we're going to build, we actually never build at all. We build something else through the cycle in order to give the customers what they're looking for. And we're continuing to invest in this. This is an area where we're partnering with fintechs, technology companies, to actually figure out how to make that assembly line the most robust, efficient, and effective capability that we can possibly can to get the best function in front of our clients as quickly as possible. The third area we're focused on is cybersecurity. And what I'd offer to you in terms of cyber, because I know you've heard a lot about the conference, is while we can think about it as cybersecurity, we tend to look at it and think about it as financial crime. And financial crime really, you know, in terms of operational risk, has three elements to it. AML, fraud, and cyber. And there's no question that the, the efforts of uh, bad people out there and the focus that they have on financial institutions or any other organization where profit is delivered or money is held is only increasing. And it's not increasing by a few points a year, it's increasing at an exponential rate. And what we see as we speed up and accelerate, whether it be we provide uh, higher limits in terms of wire transfers or whether we provide quicker settlement times on activity, absolutely those fraud opportunities increase. And it's not something that we should be scared of and it's not something that we should shy away from, but it's certainly something that has to go into the thought process and the evolution of everything that we do. And I would tell you that our budget within RBC has more than doubled in the last three years in terms of what we invest in the space. And it's all about keeping our clients safe. Innovation. Innovation is core of you know, your ability to change who you are. And there's no question, as I said earlier, that banks are changing who they are. We are changing who we are at the Royal. And innovation is not something you do on your own. Innovation is something you do in partnership with others. Uh, a couple of examples of the areas that we're partnering in right now. Uh, we're partnering with the University of Toronto, the University of Edmonton, uh, the University of Montreal uh, in, or in creating what we call Borealis AI. And some of you may have heard of that, but Borealis AI is, consists of over 60 PhDs, 30 of which are working in theoretical artificial intelligence, science and reinforcement learning, and the rest are looking at applied artificial intelligence taking some of the biggest and most complex problems and issues that we have and, sit and figuring out how they address those. We're working with the University of Waterloo. We announced uh, uh, just about six months ago a partnership with the University of Waterloo of $1.8 million where we're actually working with them on four different use cases in cyberspace, one of which is in quantum. And we're looking at these so that we can help advance science within the school system and grow talent within the school system and how we can tackle some of the big, biggest problems of our generation. And Canada has some of the best skills in the world in those two spaces of cyber and artificial intelligence. And it's a big, uh, you know, when we talk about our purpose at RBC, which is helping clients thrive and communities prosper, communities, helping communities prosper is about growing the talent in our country and, and who we partner with. Now, while we partner with academia, we're also partnering with fintechs as well. We don't see fintechs as being uh, something that uh, you know, we should compete with, absolutely not. We think that fintechs actually make us better. And that's why most recently, within the last 30 days, we've announced our own uh, API environment, open APIs that are available to those of you that either run or work for fintechs, that you can actually work right on uh, our problems with us as we expose APIs to the front end. And we'll continue to do that. That's only going to grow because we use that as part of our ability to help clients' lifestyles as opposed to just a product basis. And when I mean that, I'm talking about is a mortgage about a mortgage or is it about a home buying decision? And if you think it is a home buying decision, you're thinking far broader. We recently announced a partner with WAVE in our business-to-business -business space that we're really excited about. And we'll continue to do that because we don't believe that we can tackle this environment all on our own. We have to partner with others. And finally, I'd say we're focused on talent. 
And it's and talent, to, you know, we don't believe that you can be the number one bank without having the number one tech team. And you can't just say you're going to be the number one tech team. It's about how you how you double down and, and are creative in terms of you know the students you bring in, the skill sets that you foster within your team. I'm really excited because this week we uh, we just welcomed 1,300 students to RBC. In my group alone, we have almost 450 students working this summer. We don't put those students on just any program. We put them on some of the uh, the toughest problems we can find because they think differently. And we can actually uh, test them and they test us. And it's extraordinarily important for us to make sure that they not only learn something through this process, but we learn something as well. And we do this, you know, we've created new innovation capabilities in terms of how we do experiential learning, not just with the student program, but with our, with our own workforce as well. We have a program we call RBCX, where we pull people out of their uh, day job and we put them on a 10-week program to solve a problem with a tech sponsor and a business sponsor. So there's lots of things going on within the bank. We do think, I believe, that uh, financial institutions play a huge role in the evolution of the lifestyle of Canadians. We're responsible for securing that Canadian economy. We do over 60% of the foreign exchange that moves outside of this country on a day-to-day -day basis. We have an accountability to Canadians, to the government, to our regulators to ensure the safe passage of financial uh, instruments inside and outside this country. We have a great responsibility to our clients our, to, in order to actually allow them to compete on a global basis, whether it's personally or whether it's in business, and to be able to give them access to their money wherever they want in whatever they, way they want. And we also have a great responsibility to the community in terms of growing the next generation of talent in this country and supporting what I would call this virtual manufacturing capability with artificial intelligence and others. There's nothing more that we'd like to leave in, in, inside our community than a really wonderful workforce that has great opportunities to grow and scale in this, in this world. And that's why, we, uh, that's why we created what we call Future Launch. And our CEO, Dave McKay, made a, a commitment of $500 million to this whole program of Future Launch, which is to help young people find their way in this new millennium that we're in and this new marketplace. So with that, I'll thank you very much and uh, hand it over to Bruce, I guess.